What comes to mind when you hear the word endangered? Yeah, animals probably. The black rhino, the blue whale, green turtle, yagon, or yarawi. Now, those last two that I just mentioned, as some of you may well know, actually aren't animals at all. They're languages. To be more particular, the two of the most endangered languages in the world surviving on something like the equivalent of linguistic life support. In fact, of the nearly 6,000 languages in use across the globe today, some estimate that about half of those are currently endangered. Now, thankfully, there are organizations quite like those who are out to help save the whales, whose goal is to aid in preserving these endangered speech species. But what if it's too late? What if a language has already been assigned its death certificate? What does one do, for example, with any of the nearly 600 languages that have already been declared dead? Well, there's a growing contingent, a community of men and women across the continents who may have some ideas worth spreading, ideas rooted in the soils of rebirth and renewal. These teachers and students and researchers alike are propelled by linguistic creativity and an insatiable drive to see and hear these tongues unfettered from the chains of the past. But why and how? Well, en route to answering those two questions, let me first offer a couple of admissions. So, first admission. Somewhere along the way, I bought into the lie. I subscribed to the myth that I was bad at languages, that I was bad at learning languages. Now, I grew up in a context, in an environment where English was the norm, English was the only thing spoken, and so exposure to other languages was practically non-existent, unless, of course, you count sleeping through French and Spanish classes in high school as exposure to other languages. But even then, as a monolingual, whenever I heard those other languages spoken, I was blown away. I was fascinated. And that same fascination was present when I traveled to Israel for the first time a number of years ago and had what I might refer to as a tipping point experience, which leads me to my second admission. During my time there in Israel, I found myself day after day among a group of folks, and we were attempting to resurrect a dead language mainly by speaking it, no, not ancient Hebrew, in this case, Koine Greek, which is a version of ancient Greek. And it was dawning on me, like, I'm capable. We're capable. We humans, we're wired to use and speak languages. And that's but one of the reasons why we might take a greater interest in resurrecting dead languages, because we can. And here's another we inhabit a world today where, believe it or not, on average, one language may be passing away about every other week. So, resurrecting a dead language is not merely a means of recovering some history, although it is that, but it's also a means of reanimating some history. Just like there's beauty to be found in polishing and restoring artifacts or realia, Languages are beautiful treasures of history that we can uniquely reawaken. And here's a third reason. Even if the revitalization of a stilled or inert tongue is undertaken, say, just because I want to know it, that is, out of my own interest, then that's still a perfectly worthwhile endeavor. Yes, there may be self-centered and or group-centered motives or ambitions behind that, but in all honesty, that's central to the vitality and survival of any language. Language transmission depends on these kinds of things. And I could give numerous other reasons why, but I want to offer just one more. Ancient texts like the Bible. Now, there's no doubt that the Bible has played a big role in world history in general. And it's no secret that the Bible has had a profound influence on American history and culture in particular. And that's precisely one of the reasons why handling such a prominent text requires extreme care. Being equipped to sufficiently interact with the Bible in the languages it was first written in, namely ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, can be very important. Very important. Just, just like there's um, 
other languages that we could interact with by engaging the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. We can help learners navigate those texts. And we can find our way through the text. At the end of the day, the Bible is likely always going to be around, and it's likely always going to be a talking point. And so we can't simply dismiss it and or its adherence outright. Instead, what's needed is a healthy, knowledgeable, and responsible engagement with it. Well, those are some of the reasons why, but what about the how question? How does one go about restoring the pulse to a stopped language? Well, briefly, I want to offer just three suggestions. There are many more, but these are drawn mainly from my own experiences in attempting to do this with the Conversational Koine Institute. An early step in resurrecting a dead language is to begin recovering native resources. And once we've done this, we can begin dredging or mining them for helpful data. In my case, for example, because I like to work with ancient languages like those of the Bible, the natural place to begin is with ancient texts. And these come in many different forms. Now, obviously, I don't have the luxury of tapping into an audio or video recording made by, say, some ancient Greek person. But spending time with the deposit of texts available is an option. And much can be learned about the language from this. A subsequent step is to begin creating a community or communities where the language becomes a focal point. Everyone in the community has shared goals, one of which is gaining fluency in the target language. That's why speaking the language and hearing others speak the language is so important. And once we've established a speaking community, we want to add people to it. And today's technologies allow us to do that in ways and on levels, even international levels, like we've never been able to do before. Another step is to begin creating new resources. And I think this step is at its best when numerous people from within the community are working together, innovating together, and taking risks together to develop these new tools. Leveraging the skills and talents of the community is the way to go. And really, it takes a community. Community is essential. And it's my hope that those within this listening community today, and perhaps those with ears to hear across the wider global community, would maybe take a greater interest in the languages around them, whether those languages are living, dying, or already dead, and maybe even begin interacting with them. And so with that, my friends, as we might say in Koine Greek, evkaristo, you mean. And if you're not sure what that means, well, as a native Kentuckian, I'm inclined to translate it as thank y'all. <laughs>